Good morning, I'm Heather White, serving as the faculty director for the Dairy Innovation Hub. Thank you so much for coming this morning, whether it's virtual or in person. We're really excited to have everyone here for our first ever Dairy Symposium. So I'll go over a few housekeeping items as we get started uh, so that you can get the most out of the day and the hybrid experience. We have folks in person, all of you sitting here, which we're really excited about after a long hiatus of in-person events. And we also have folks joining us online. So we have people watching the chat. They'll be sharing questions with us from that. Uh, for both audiences, we're recording everything today. So if when Randy speaks later, you just have to watch it a second time, you'll certainly have the chance. It'll be recorded and available for you to view again and again. No pressure, Randy. <laughs> All right. Um, there's also a lot of links on the website if you miss any of the sessions or if you want to look at the posters more in depth later. A lot of posters here today, they're all posted online. So across the three campuses, we've funded over 100 projects since the inception of the Hub. Just 30 of them are featured on posters, but we're very excited about the breadth across all of the research that will be shared. For those of you in person, the detailed schedules in your folder, speaker bios and abstracts are online, and there's a QR code for you to follow for those. For those online, all of that information is in the symposium section of the website. If you have questions at any point, in person we ask you to use one of the microphones so that those online can hear, and online you can type those in uh, and we'll make sure they get asked. If we don't get to a question, we'll be sure to follow up with you by email. All right, so uh, last here on the housekeeping. Events like this are a huge undertaking to put on. And I don't know if any of you have tried to put something on since COVID. A hybrid event is basically planning two conferences. We've got some ladies from PDPW here and they'll tell you the same thing. So I would like to recognize Maria Walt. Please stand up. Thank you. As the first ever dairy symposium, Maria had the very fun, fun task of taking all of our random ideas, which were sometimes not in sync with each other's, and take them and form them into what you see today. This is our first event for the symposium. And so it might look different next year or the next year. It might be longer, might be different, might have more components. So please, when you get the survey, let us know. What did you like? What would you like to see next year? What could we do differently? Give us that feedback. I'd also like to recognize uh, the other folks helping us make this happen. Alex Nelson in the back and Cal's External Relations. Where are you? Nikki and Nikki. <laughs> Um, and Heidi loaned us some um, bandwidth today because it takes a lot of people, feet on the ground, and so we appreciate that help. All right. Okay. The next thing I'd like to do is encourage you to get the most out of today. Network, talk to people, meet people. So to help you do that, if you're a new Hub-funded faculty, please stand up. If you joined us yesterday, you know we did 11 searches in the last year and a half and we hired 12 faculty. Some are here today, so please go introduce those folks. Welcome, to, welcome them to UW. Hear a little bit about what they're working on. Thank you. And then also we have the liaisons from all three campuses here today. Steve Kelm from River Falls, Troy Rungi from Madison, and Tara Montgomery from Platteville. So find those individuals and talk to them about what they're doing on their campuses. You'll also notice that advisory council members and committee members have ribbons on their name badges. So please take the opportunity to mingle to talk. It was great to see that this morning. All right, so I think that's all the housekeeping. Maria, did I miss anything critical? All right. So many of you have heard the story of the marker board. And in fact, the picture was cycling this morning of how sometimes when you dream big, you come up with an, an idea that has great breadth, great potential impact. But just a picture on a marker board is a long way from reality, right? 
So a lot of people help take that vision that the universities that have ag campuses at UW could have an impact that's much bigger than any one of those labs. That they could help fuel the research, the teaching, and the outreach that was important to the farms in Wisconsin and beyond. And that's something that it's been a pleasure to help make reality. There were a lot of people involved. Maybe Mitch and Shelly could wave or stand up, not to put you on the spot here. Uh, we're very involved as active stakeholders and Kent Weigel, who drew up the original proposal, and then at some point handed me a document and said, here, have fun, make it work. To take something from an idea to reality was a lot of steps, and it was pretty daunting at first, but I am beyond excited to have all of us here today, so much breadth of research that we can share, that we can network with each other, and all of it contributing to keeping Wisconsin's dairy at the forefront. So with that, I hope you enjoy the day. I hope you get a lot out of it. I hope you follow up with each other afterwards. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences here at UW-Madison, Dean Kate. Well, thank you, Heather. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you here today. I feel like we've been working two years to get to this point. And if you were involved yesterday in the summit, well then welcome back as well. I want to extend a, a special welcome to our, uh, our partners, uh, our academic partners at uh, River Falls and Platteville. Uh, something that's been so special about the hub is that we've been able to deepen our connections and really make some real research collaborations. So um, I wanted to uh, introduce uh, the, the two deans from River, River Falls and Platteville, uh, Dale Gallenberg. I, there's Dale from River Falls and Wayne Weber. Is Wayne here this morning? Haven't seen him yet? There he is. Wayne Weber wearing the Platteville colors. Very nice, Wayne. I like that. <laughs> uh, appreciate having you here. You know, I love the fact that the Dairy Innovation Hub has an origin story that Heather just referred to, and central to that was the sketch of ideas on the whiteboard. Um, I wasn't there, um, you know, I kind of got on the train later, but as I understand it, the idea from the beginning was always, how can we increase the capacity for research in dairy writ large so that the industry can not just survive, but be sustainable and thrive and be vibrant. Um, and th there were four different areas that were sketched out. Uh, enriching human health and nutrition, uh, stewarding land and water resources, ensuring animal health and welfare, and growing farm businesses. And all, you know, farm businesses and communities. Excellence uh, in all of those areas is, is critical to keeping this industry vibrant. And uh, today we're going to see some representation of projects in each of the four quadrants in the concurrent sessions. And we have two plenary sessions as well uh, that will each take up well, one, of, one of the areas. There's some work in one of the areas. And I, I think that both of them are um, great examples of research to provoke us to greater heights, uh, to think critically, um, and, and to really set high aspirations. Um, so the first one is um, Randy Jackson. Uh, it's my pleasure to have a chance to introduce Randy. Randy is a professor in uh, agronomy at UW-Madison, and he is a collaborator on the Net Zero Initiative. This new multi-state, multi-institution project is working to help cut greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. dairy industry and is funded in part through a $10 million grant from the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research. Um, on campus, most of Randy's lab seeks to understand how the management of agroecosystems influences their productivity, carbon storage, nutrient retention, and habitat, all important topics for U.S. dairy as we look forward to the grand challenges of today and tomorrow. Uh, Randy is also a collaborator on Gla Grassland 2.0, which is a diverse group of scientists, farmers, and public and private sector professionals dedicated to finding sustainable agricultural solutions. So please join me in welcoming Randy as our opening speaker.
Is that working? Thank you, Dean Kate, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to uh, be a guest here at the Dairy Innovation Hub inaugural uh, conference. And uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to take some liberties to do a little editorializing and a little commentary here as I and, and try and weave that into a research type presentation. Mm -hmm. um, and and part of that commentary is the title of my talk, which I've. Uh, listed here as what will dairy innovation look like an early version of the title was will we know innovation when we see it and uh, a lot of this is like uh, me asking the question to myself and to my colleagues quite often like what do we mean by innovation are we talking about incremental improvements are we talking about transformative change and the mm. takeaway message of my talk today will be we need transformative change and we need it badly <clears throat> all that said the first step, we've taken a step in the right direction with a really fantastic logo. I love the Dairy Innovation Hub logo. Am I doing something wrong here, Maria? No, you're fine. Keep going. So let me start with what I often call the Bernie Sanders part of my talk and try and get through it quickly so that I don't bring us down too far. These are tumultuous times. I want to make sure we have our eyes open here, and I'm sure we all do, about the uh, the kind of problems that we're dealing with, and I've listed them here really as sort of the four grand challenges, in my opinion, uh, that we're dealing with. And the first is soil, atmosphere, and water degradation, which are all at least partially driven by agriculture, some exclusively, but at least partially driven. And, you know, just, I'm not going to walk through all these, but we estimate we've lost about half of the organic matter in our soils. We estimate that we've lost about a third of our topsoil. And by we, I mean the scientific community, not me. Uh, our groundwaters are polluted. Our surface waters are polluted. In some places in Wisconsin, we're moving towns out of the way of flooding. That's exacerbated by the way we do agriculture. Bird numbers have been estimated to be declining to the tune of 3 billion birds lost since 1970, mostly related to agriculture and the way we do it. Pollinators are declining. We have over 260 herbicide-resistant plants now in the US that makes the herbicides completely useless. And of course, systemic inequality is a massive problem. Poverty drives hunger. And in our own Wisconsin, we see this playing out largely as pushing people off the land through consolidation. Many of us think this is one of the biggest problems that we face, consolidation, pushing people off the land. Of course, racial, gender, rural, urban divide inequities are, are huge. And now I'm getting to the climate change thing, which most people uh, you know, list number one as the number one existential threat. This is the Bernie Sanders part. I'm trying to bring it to a close. The problems are massive. So what will dairy innovation look like? in the face of those massive problems. I would posit that we need to focus on outcomes, not just getting better. That we need to put some markers down about what better will be. That it will be healthy ecosystems, not just ecosystems that lose less soil or lose less carbon, but ecosystems that build soil and build carbon, that retain soil and nutrients, that support a flourishing biodiversity that increase bird and pollinator numbers. That they're healthy communities that have metrics like profitable and abundant farms with diverse farmers that re are representative, if not over-representative, over of the types of people in the world. That we have healthy livestock. Metrics of this might be lower vet bills. I'm making this up now because I'm getting over my skis with respect to animal health. I'm sure there's a whole list of metrics here that are important. Better quality of life for those animals. And then, with respect to healthy individuals, less disease, lower health care costs. We must use what my colleague Mike Bell calls our agroecological imagination as we think about innovation. That's just kind of a fancy social science way of saying, we've got to consider all these things simultaneously and figure out how to get there and solve this for the solution space that we set out. 
We've got to use sophisticated models that many of you are developing to help keep track of all these things, because I can't keep track of all of them in my head. I don't have enough grad students to keep track of all of them in my, in, in my lab. We need to work across disciplinary boundaries for sure. Transdisciplinary approaches are critical. Transdis transdisciplinary approaches are ones that work across disciplines and the academe, but also across sectors of society, farmers, industry folks, agency folks, et cetera. To me, those are the three approaches that are gonna push us towards innovation. And with respect to the things that we do, we have to innovate holistically, which is to say, around this whole wheel, we have to focus on outcomes, as I've already said, rather than just incremental improvements and getting a little bit better. And I think we have to transform the system and open up our minds about what could be, how it could be different. Let go of the current calculus. Oh yeah, but the farm bill. Oh yeah, but uh, the regulations. We gotta think bigger than we've been thinking. And a lot of you are doing that clearly. I look at the posters around here and I talk to you and I, and I hear these things. So let me transition now, now that I've waved my arms, Bernie Sanders-like. I don't know why I keep coming back to that, but I do. <coughs> and talk about this thing that I've been working on called the Net Zero Initiative. I've been working on this thanks to Matt Ruark, who's a soil scientist who dragged me kicking and screaming into the project along with Dr. Greg Sanford. It's been a fun project so far. The Net Zero Initiative is something that the dairy industry has conjured up, I think initially as a marketing scheme, to talk about how dairy can be net zero with respect to carbon balance. It's a laudable goal. And they have these various foci. I'm not gonna walk through all these, but they're focused on how we produce feed for livestock, how we take care of and handle livestock, how manure is taken care of and handled, and then this bit about how we might actually get co-products and make energy, et cetera, et cetera. Troy Rungi can tell you all about that. Uh, super important elements. We're focused in my group primarily on the feed production side of things. And so I wanna tell you just quickly about this project that's emerged from the Net Zero Initiative. If it started out as a marketing scheme, it now is getting some real steam as a research project. And we call that project the Dairy Soil and Water Regen Project. It doesn't really roll off the tongue, but we're getting there. It's funded by the um, Foundation for Food and Ag Research, FFAR. They funded it to the tune of $10 million, and then industry kicked in another $12 million so, or so. So there's, there's a lot of money behind this project. And it's headed up by the Dairy Research Institute, which is... Uh, part of the Dairy Management uh, Incorporated. And the subawards are to the Soil Health Institute and the many land-grant universities across uh, the country. And you can see that UW-Madison and UW-Platteville are part of that, that consortium. And the main idea is to look at various interventions in our current food production, feed production system. Um, and to do it similarly across these territories, but in ways that are more nuanced based on the region that you're in. And so the real sort of high level thing that we're doing is looking at three different things. Reducing tillage, which is represented up here on the top. Minimum tillage, so trying to minimize the amount of soil disturbance that we do. Uh, cover crops, which is indicated on the bottom left, adding crops under the shoulders of the growing season, and then some sort of manure-based fertilizer application, composting manure, and there's lots of engineers that are involved trying to different ways to compost that manure and get it uh, applied to the, uh, to the system. And then the idea is to look at how those things, individually and in concert, are able to affect soil carbon sequestration environmental outcomes like nitrous oxide emissions, soil health benefits. So it's pretty ambitious. It's pretty ambitious and there's a lot of money behind it. But I would argue that it's also pretty incremental. I mean, these are big changes, but it's pretty incremental. It's trying to find ways to fix the current system. 
as opposed to thinking about a transformed and different system. Fortunately, my friend and colleague Josh Posner, who's passed away about eight years ago now, started this long-term cropping systems trial where we've done a bunch of this research uh, already. In fact, started it in 1989, so it's been in the ground 30 years now. And it was managed and run by Janet Headkey for a long time. And then Greg Sanford, who works with me now, uh, was Josh's grad student. And Greg published his PhD work looking at the first 20 years of soil carbon change across six different cropping systems. Continuous corn, minimum till corn and soybeans, organic corn, soybeans, and wheat, wheat as a cover crop, conventional corn and alfalfa, three years of alfalfa, organic corn, oats as a cover crop and alfalfa. So you can see here we have a lot of these elements that we're talking about with this net zero initiative. And then this cool season pasture, uh, cool season grassland, raised by dairy heifers. You don't have to stare at it very long to see that across 20 years, to a one meter depth, all of the systems were losing. The technical term is a crap ton of carbon. <laughs> they were losing a lot of carbon. Okay. Now you look in the literature and you can see a lot of studies that show, oh no, if you add cover crops, you gain carbon. Most of those studies are focused on the surface soil. Okay, they're important, they're good studies. But when we look at the entire depth, we might have seen increases in the surface, but losses at depth that offset the increases at surface. That was definitely the case in the pasture, where we saw a significant, significant increase in carbon in the surface horizons, but losses at depth. And we don't know why. We have hypotheses. Not enough roots going down there to replenish carbon. A signal from climate change already, that the soils are warming and resulting in more carbon being lost. So it's a grim picture, to say the least. We have a grad student now who's grinding away the data over there as we speak on the next 10 years. And I can't talk about the data yet, but let me just say it doubles down on the story. We're losing carbon in our annual grain systems. In this part of the world, on mollusks, there's all kinds of caveats. <clears throat> Nonetheless, I sent a grad student, Ashley Becker, out to look at soil carbon in about 32, 33 sites all around southern Wisconsin. She went to these farms, sat down with farmers who had pastures, interviewed them about how they used the pastures, what they did with them, asked them to find a paired site that was in row crop production that was on the same soil, same soil type, same use, land use history, did her due diligence to figure that out. And what you can see here on the left is that when you look at the difference between the grazed and the row crop pairs, the grazed systems had a lot more carbon in the surface horizons, similar to what we found at Wix. No difference from 15 to 30 centimeters. And when she looked over time at the age of the pastures, which she uh, gleaned from these interviews with the farmers, the older the pastures were, it's a, it's a weak signal. Part of her PhD work is to f flesh this out a bit. It's a weak signal, but nonetheless a signal that the older the pasture was, the more carbon there was in the system. And that carbon was accumulating, at least in the surface horizons, to the tune of about 321 kilograms per meter squared per year. OK. so. Using those data, I've been doing some back of the envelope calculations. This is not life cycle analysis. Perfect timing. Doug Reinemann walked in right when I said life cycle analysis. Don't hit me too hard about this, Doug. This is Randy's back of the envelope calculations while the Packers game was on in the background. Pulling numbers from the literature to try and get my head around what net zero would mean or how close we are to it now, or how far away we are from it now. So here's a 300-acre confinement farm with 182 cows being fed corn, mainly. I'm sure other stuff, too. There's a lot of nuance that I didn't include. And I'm not going to walk through all these numbers. You can take my word for it, that it sums up to be about 1,120 CO2 equivalents of emissions per 
per year. I don't know what that means. So I went to the EPA's website where they have this calculator that you can take 1120 and turn it into all sorts of things. And the one that kind of made sense to me was the number of cars driven 12,000 miles at 22.5 miles per gallon. And that's about 244 cars driving around that much every year. I don't know, that gives a little more context. In the meantime, I dug into Center for Dairy Research, uh, sorry, Center for Dairy Profitability's website. <coughs> I actually didn't dig into the website. I know Tom Kriegel, who worked there for many, many years, and looked at his data, which was downloading farm data from a financial database. So these are real farm data based on real farm data. The net income from farm operations is about $457 per cow which I scaled up to the number of cows. So the income for that farm is about $83,000. So then I thought, well, what happens if that same farm was in grazing? Perennial grassland that we've seen at least can hold on to the carbon, maybe accumulate it. I plugged in Greg's numbers for soil carbon loss. I'm not using a pointer because it won't show up on Zoom, but down towards the bottom there of zero. No soil carbon change. The graze system, you can see more than halves the amount of cars, the equivalent number of cars. Only 100 cars instead of 244. I thought it might be less. I was kind of surprised it was as high as it was. But that's with no soil carbon change. When I plug in Ashley's numbers, which are about negative 321 kilograms per hectare, I think I said meter squared before, that was a typo, um, it re it's reduced to about 68. And of course I did some solving for this to figure out where it would get to be net zero. And it's if the soil happens to be accumulating about a ton, sorry, about a half a ton of soil carbon a year. Now the old Chicago Climate Exchange was paying grass farmers for a ton of carbon per year. A half a ton would make it net zero. I don't think the annual grain based system in confinement can be made net zero without massive transformative changes. It's more than carbon though. It's gotta be about more than carbon. We've gotta think about our water. We've gotta think about our, uh, our soils. There's another super grad student, Tracy Campbell, who works with Chris Kuchark in the agronomy department and the agroecology program. She just published this paper in the journal Ecosystems using a model, AgroIBIS, that has been validated and used in a lot of research and she asked the question, again, thinking about outcomes and then solving for those outcomes, what would it take to reach the EPA mandated total maximum daily load phosphorus numbers for the Ahar River watershed? And the solution was, if we start now, reduce the number of animal units in the watershed by half and put half of the ag land in perennial grass and do that for 50 years, by 2070, we'll meet those targets. I want you to have a sense for the magnitude of the problem. Incremental fixes are not gonna do it. They're not gonna get us where we need to go if we're gonna have clean water. We need transformative change. This is the basis for this Grassland 2.0 project that Dean Kate mentioned, where we move from a system that's dominated by annual grain crops to one that's dominated by perennial grassland. It's not to say we don't grow grain anywhere, but we've got to find places to grow it that are more benign. And that's exactly what this decision support tool, this model that my friend and colleague Claudio Gratton and, and his group have been working on since way back in the GLBRC days, the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center. I guess it's still going. But we started building this tool called SmartScape, which allows us to look at the landscape and say, where are the hot spots where we could put some grass and reduce phosphorus? And so what this map over here shows you is the area northwest of Lake Mendota. And what we uh, asked the model was to show us all the land planted to corn and beans within 500 feet of a stream. And that's what's in red. <coughs> Turns out to be about 20, 25% of the landscape 
that's planted in corn and beans is within 500 feet of a stream. And then we were able to use this tool to run a lot of different scenarios, but what stood out was that, if you see the numbers in the middle there, with grass buffer strips around all the streams that are 500 foot wide, 500 feet wide on both sides, those are big buffer strips, we could reduce phosphorus loading into the watershed by 67%. There are hot spots on the landscape that we can target and put into perennial grass, we can get a, a, a long way towards our, our water quality goals. If we had a thousand foot buffer strips on both sides, we could get reduce 90% of the phosphorus that's coming into the water. But again, a thousand foot buffer strips are basically inverting the landscape from annual grain base to perennial grass. <clears throat> At the same time, we've been developing this tool called Grayscape which is meant to be less of a landscape tool, but more of a within a farm, like sit down with a farmer, maybe like SNAP Plus, Laura. Uh, but in addition to what SNAP Plus does, Grayscape allows the farmer to look at, um, I know I'm gonna say something that's gonna tick you off here, so let me pick carefully, bird populations, pollinator populations, in addition to profitability, carbon, nitrogen, all these things simultaneously. In the meantime, Brad Barham in the Ag and Applied Econ um, Department, working with John Hendrickson at the Center for Integrated Ag Systems, and Connor Mulholland, a super student, and uh, Jim Munch, a farmer, have been working on this thing called the Heifer Grazing Compass Tool, which is meant for CAFO operators to explore how they might reduce their costs by grazing their heifers, which we see as a huge opportunity to help transform the landscape. Speaking of costs, let me come back to Tom Kriegel's numbers, which are astounding to me. He published these in several white papers quite a while ago. <clears throat> we recently got them published in Horde's Dairyman. It looks at a grazing and confinement operation. Sorry, it doesn't look at a single one. It looks at a whole bunch of them, downloads all the data from this database, and looks at averages. And you see at the bottom that the grazing systems are almost twice as profitable as the confinement operations because their costs of production are so much lower, because their capital investments are so much lower. Not only is this an opportunity for dairy farmers to possibly stay in business if they're struggling, it's an opportunity for young farmers who don't have a lot of capital to get in. And so we see this as a great opportunity to help diversify dairy farming and help diversify our landscapes by getting more and more young people, more and more different kinds of young people into farming. <clears throat> the takeaway message on the right, uh, if you look at the blue there, uh, this, this metric has always been hard for me to get my head around, but it's the cost of production as a percent of income. And you can see that the way I read this, the blue there, for every hundred dollars of income, the grazing farmer is spending $76. For every $100 of income, the confinement operator is spending $90. This can scale. This isn't just for farms that are small or mid-sized. There are big farms that are doing this. This is innovative. And so part of the message is innovation doesn't have to be new technologies, new gadgets. We need that stuff, no doubt. But there are old ways, so to speak, and I can hear some of my grazing friends saying, it's not old ways. <laughs> there are new ways that we do grazing that help make things profitable and productive. And it's not just Tom that's found this. Uh, there are folks all across the eastern seaboard and the mid-Atlantic states that have found the same thing. I'm not going to walk through all this in the interest of time, but one of the key findings is that in addition to lower feed production costs, veterinary bills are lower. Medical bills are lower for livestock. These are all part of reducing the cost of production. Other folks have found similar things. This is also what we found at the WICST, the Wisconsin Integrated Cropping Systems Trial. Jean-Paul Chavaz, an ag and applied economist here on campus, published this back in 2009 with Josh and others. And you can see that if you take away the government payments on the right, the rotational grazing system was clearly the most profitable just to cut to the chase, 
one of the reasons that we don't do more of this is because of the government payments. So let me turn to people and then try and wrap this up. I talked about carbon, water, people. This is the most important thing. My colleague Mike Bell, when Claudio and I got here along with Mike to start the agroecology cluster hire back in 2003, Claudio and I were sitting around scheming about all these projects we were going to do and we we're going to look at biodiversity and carbon and all this. And Mike said, what about the people? We've got to think about the people. Sorry, that was not my best Mike impersonation. <clears throat> but I have a good one. Without the mask, it's better. Okay, so if we're going to move from our current system, if we're going to transform agriculture, which is what we have to do, we have to engage with people in different ways. I'm so glad Doug Reinemann's here because he turned me on to this idea of integral ecology. And we don't call it that in our Grassland 2.0 project because that sounds so academic. But integral ecology posits that we have to connect with people, I think, if I understand it. I don't know if I understand it yet, but anyway, I'm working on it. We have to connect with people as individuals and in groups. And that we have to connect with them on their exterior as well as the interior. We have to ask people, what do you do as a farmer? What do you do as an extension agent? What do you do as a scientist? Oh, I write papers. I produce knowledge. I produce corn, I, I produce beans. We're farmers, you know, we're scientists. This is what we do, we're saving the planet. <clears throat> but that interior side, which I have no idea what I'm talking about now, I'm way out over my skis, that interior part is critical to the conversation. This is like when you lie in bed at night, you're thinking, am I really a scientist? I can't believe I'm a scientist. I was just some Yehu suburban kid. Anyway, these are the things that we have to connect with as well as who we are as a group. And this is all based on lots of uh, important theoretical work. In our Grassland 2.0 project, one of the ways that we're trying to connect with people at the individual level is by conducting what we call listening sessions, oral histories, turn on the microphone and ask people to tell us. How did we get here? What was the past? What's the current situation? Where should we go? Free yourself up of that calculus of here's what, here's what this future will be like because of the farm bill and because of this and because of that. We have to allow people to dream big about what's possible. One of the things that we do is convene what we call learning hubs. In the past, we called them land labs. We can call them whatever we want. They're place-based conversations where we continue to come back and engage with folks around what it is they want and need out of the landscape, out of agriculture. We engage humanities in these conversations. We have artists drawing pictures of what the world looks like. And then, of course, these exterior things we're dealing with mainly with these models that I've already talked about significantly. All right, so let me wrap up. On the right is Craig Van Duvel. He's a dairy farmer up near Green Bay. I went and visited him at uh, the invitation of the guy on the left there, uh, Adam Abel, who's the state grazing lands coordinator for NRCS. <coughs> Craig has 125 milk uh, cows, and I don't think he would mind me telling you that he was ready to call it quits, like so many other dairy farmers. I mean, we've lost 500 dairy farms a year for the entire time I've been in Wisconsin. Not to be flippant about it, but I don't think it's my fault. Since 2003, when I got here, we've lost 500 farms a year. It's a straight line trajectory. If it keeps playing out, we've got about 12 years between, before there are five farms left. I don't think that's going to happen. It better not. But that's the trajectory we're on. Craig was going to be one of those statistics. Adam convinced him that he could reduce his feed production costs by planting grass. He planted grass. Adam said, now wait, now this, let's just titrate this in. Let's just let a few cows out. Craig said, nah, just open the gate and let them all out. All 125. They went out in the pasture. They bellered and yelled at him for half a, half a day. But now he's like a grazing acolyte, and it's only been a few months. 
He's like, this saved me. I'm doing this. I said, what's the best part of it, Greg, uh, Craig? He said, the best part is that I wake up, I feed them, I do my chores just like I used to do. I let them out into the grassland, and then I follow them, and I go out there, and I find a place over there, and I take a nap. And I was like, okay, you take a nap? He's like, yeah, because they just feed themselves, and it's so easy. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this from farmers. It saved their lives as farmers. It saved their identity as farmers. This is critical. I already hear the questions. Is it, doesn't it mean we're going to produce less milk? Yes. Aren't we already supplying too much milk? Uh, I think yes. Anyway, we can talk more about that. Young people are thrilled about grassland agriculture. Every year, undergraduates and graduate students come through here dying to get involved in perennial grassland agriculture. Here's some of our agroecology grad students talking to Paul Onan, a, a dairy farmer up, uh, up north. Here's some of the undergrads uh, out learning about how beef grazing uh, can be used for wildlife uh, management. Last story, one minute. Last story. This is uh, Bert Paris's daughter, Megan. Bert runs an 80 head milking operation down near Belleville. His daughter, Megan, grew up on the farm and got out, just like so many other young farm kids. Not all of them, I know I'm painting with a broad brush. Went to the city, came here, got her degree, got a job in insurance sales, wanted nothing to do with the farm. Bert switched to grazing. Now Megan is excited to take over. She's quit her job as an insurance agent. She wants to run the farm. She wants to raise her kids there. She wants to raise a family there. It's productive. It's profitable. It's a good place for family. These are critical elements as we think about innovation. My last message is we've got to restore some of the functionality, if not all of the functionality of the original prairie to our agriculture. We've got to shore it up. We've got to hold on to carbon and build carbon, not lose it. We've got to hold on to nutrients and build the capacity of our systems to be productive, not work whittle away at it. And we've got to bring people back to the land in droves. We can't end up with five farms. Some of my colleagues say, actually, that'd be better. It'd be easier. It'll be easier to contain all the nutrients, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think that's true. Let's have a conversation about that. I'm done. Thanks, Maria. Thank you for your attention and allowing me to pontificate a bit. Thanks, Randy. Now we have some time for questions. So Alex Nelson and myself will be kind of running around. You can make your way to the mic if you have a question, comment. We do have some from online as well. Does anyone want to start? Did you up that train uh, just because I was going on too long? <laughs> right. That was planned. I guess we'll start with an online question, maybe sure. kind of get some things going. Or do we have? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Shelley. Re really interesting, and thank you for presenting. Um, when you were talking about return on investment and the grazing model, which is, is very, very, very interesting. What kind of um, value were you giving to the cost value of the land as far as either per acre and rent or, you know, what we've seen with a lot of the land around us selling for 10 and 12,000 an acre, how does that model work? That's part one. Part two is um, when we're talking about the cows and the grass, what do we do? You know, we kind of have a short, a short season in Wisconsin. Um, how does that, how did that fit into the model and how does that work ecologically? Yeah, those are, thank you. Those are both great questions and things that we're actively working on in our Grassland 2.0 project is how does that stuff pencil out? How does it work? <clears throat> where doesn't it work? And, you know, where do we need innovation and change to make it work? Um, this issue of the value of land is real, particularly vexing. I mean, if I can just, the way I often flippantly talk about it is, it's amazing that things that degrade the soil improve the value of land, and things that improve the soil seem to reduce the value of land. 
I don't know how we deal with that. I, I don't have an answer. Um, somehow, the fact that we're degrading the land by reducing its carbon, its organic matter, its productivity over time, that has to be built into our economic models. And I, I'm not smart enough to know how we do that. Innovate. <laughs> um, definitely it's policy levers. Definitely it's economic levers, yeah. Um, I have a friend who inherited some land recently. She's a professor on campus. The land's in Missouri. She doesn't, she's not a farmer. Uh, she wants to do right by the land, but the, by far the easiest thing to do is just to let the neighbor grow corn and beans on it. And the thought of allowing it to go to grazing, the main impediment is the land value will go down, or at least what people are willing to pay for it will go down. So we have to deal with this, and I don't have a good answer. What was the second part of your question? Oh, the seasonality, yes. This is a huge issue for graziers, obviously, uh, for all of us. Um, so many graziers are leaving their livestock out all year round and feeding them with bales of hay to maintain the rotational element of their grazing operation to keep the excreta distributed in, in time and space. Not all of them are doing that. Some of them bring them in for the winter and feed. Um, the economics of that are built into Tom Kriegel's data. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't understand enough to know like how leaving them out one more a month affects things. I do know that hearing some of my friends who are running grazing operations, they talk about a two or three month window if they really work the system well and stockpile their forage, that there's about a two or three month window, even though winter to me lasts seven months they're in for two or three months. But those are critical elements of maintaining the cost savings. Other questions? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Maria's handling the question. On the, and great presentation. On the same um, idea of land use, I was wondering what the implications are for, for land that's needed to produce per head. And then if that fact, how that factors into your um, to your carbon models. You're asking about the amount of land that would be needed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I haven't done this for dairy yet. I need to. I just got done doing it for beef, for the entire U.S. beef system. And um, we certainly need more land per animal to bring them to the same weight in beef production. And I imagine that's the same sort of scenario with, with milk production. Um, there's 12 million acres of corn grown in the U.S. right now to feed livestock in feedlots. If those 12 million acres were put into grass, a lot of those animals could come out of the feedlot. There's 30 million acres of corn grown to make ethanol, which is silly. If we could put gra cows on grass on that land, that would be an advance in the right direction. I say it's silly because as my friend Jason Hill at Minnesota likes to say, making ethanol out of corn is basically like figuring out how to turn natural gas and oil into gas tank fuel. So um, 30 million acres there, 12 million acres there, just of corn land. And then there's some 20 or 30 million acres of conservation reserve program land that is supposed to be grassland that people struggle to maintain as grassland because it wants to convert to woody species. It needs some disturbance. So that's more land that could be brought in line. I guess the main point is <clears throat> it doesn't mean displacing food production, which is one of the arguments you hear about. If we put our animals that are in confinement on grass, there's enough land now that's currently feeding those animals that they could feed themselves on grassland. But that analysis needs to be penciled out, for sure. Hi. Um, no, thank you for a great, great presentation. Um, my name is Scott Rankin. I'm chair of the F Food Science Department. And um, I'm a dairy foods processing extension specialist. And I say that so you appreciate my perspective here. I'm often asked to speak on the role of, of uh, non-animal milks. Um, and the last count, I think I had like 39 different, you know, soy, rice, and so forth. And 
How does that, how mature are we, how mature or clear is the science if we view, uh, you know, food, uh, milk for instance, the protein value, the fat, calories, etc. How mature is our science to really to view, you know, plant-based mat um, materials from kind of a net zero perspective? I'm not quite sure I'm catching the gist of your question. Like, like so, so again, the argument that the plant-based uh, world would look at, they'd look at that picture there and say, it's great, it, it, it remove the cows, <laughs> right, and we're fine. So I, I guess what I'm worried, you know, they, and they present various views on it, and I guess my question is really, if we were to apply the math that you've applied to dairy, you know, to the generation of plant-based mm. proteins, for instance, mm. how mature and clear is that science? I don't have the expertise to answer that question. I, it's not something I've delved into. Um, I really don't, I really don't, I couldn't even tell you what plant-based, I, I don't even know what they're using when they say plant-based products. I tend to assume it's soybeans and other legumes and that sort of thing, and or other oil plants. Soy and, you know, yeah. cashew, almond, hemp, you know, like, in yeah, my last presentation, I think I had 38 or 39 different plant-based milks, you know, uh -huh. so it's really, quite broad right now. And that's one of their arguments is certainly about environmental footprints. And I, I struggle with, you know, how, again, where we're at in that argument. Yeah. So. so all I can say is that if I did the same sort of analysis that I've done here with the dairy and that I've done with the beef and, and brought in the uh, plant-based milk or plant-based product thing, um, my understanding is that most of those systems are relying on annual plants like soybeans. And annual plants just have inherent prob problems. Most of their energy is above ground, little of it's below ground. That's what leads to the loss of carbon. Most of them get disturbed part of the year, either when they're planted or when they're harvested or when people incorporate residue, et cetera. So all of those things would point me to, when we think about the carbon balance of the system, they're likely to be sources to the atmosphere. That's about as far down the road as I'm willing to go on that. But it's an interesting, interesting thought. I'm not supposed to. I'm Thank you. On the earlier part of your topic, you were really focusing in on carbon and carbon sequestration. Um, have you done any or looked into the work that Fr Frank Mintlauer out of UC Davis was doing? Because he had explained a lot of the times that corn and a lot of our grains is a very cyclical as far as carbon being released and then brought back in when you compared it to like automotion and other where we're drilling for it. So how the carbon was diverse. So when we're comparing apples to apples versus different fruit. Yeah, so you're asking about Frank Mitlinar's work out at UC Davis, which is really great work. Um, I'm not familiar with what he's had to say about carbon cycling in corn. All I can say is that the data that I showed today um, are the net result of what's happening in the ecosystem, right? So the no doubt carbon is cycling with corn, just like it's cycling in grasslands. Carbon's coming in through NPP. Carbon's being lost through microbial respiration. The net change over time is what I showed today. If you look at it at any particular point in time or even over a year, man, there are point, parts of the year, as uh, Susie Wiesner and, and Paul Stoy can tell you, there are parts of the year that the system is a huge net sink, and then there's parts of the year where it's a huge net uh, source to the atmosphere depending on where we are in the season. The part about Frank's work that I think is so important and that I didn't talk about is how we deal with an account for methane, which is a flow gas, so to speak. It goes into the atmosphere and it's fleeting. It only has a resonance time in the atmosphere of about 10 years. So there's a huge controversy in the literature about how we account for that methane. Should it be counted the same way nitrous oxide, which stays in the atmosphere for 100 plus years should be counted the same way that ni uh, nitrous oxide is or even that CO2 is. So that's an important nuance to how we do the carbon balance uh, work. Great. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're going to have to stop with questions. I'm sorry. It's great to see so many questions in the room and online. So if you're here in person, I encourage you to talk to Randy later in the day or talk to others. If you're online, we'll make sure to get you an answer or direct you to Randy if the question was specific to his talk. So let's thank Randy one more time for a thought-provoking talk.
And now we're going to move into our first breakout session. We want to give you a few minutes to grab a refill of coffee if you need it, and we will head up to the third floor, so up one flight. If you're interested in the Stewarding Land and Water Resources track, you'll go to the North Woods Room. And if you're interested in the Enriching Human Health and Nutrition track, you'll go to the Industry Room. So again, head to the stairs and go up one floor, and you'll see the rooms there. And we hope to continue all of the great discussion in those rooms. Thank you.